adventures over the years over the centuries and I mention it because now Hi, this is Robert Anthony Gibbons when Humanists Attack, another episode where we uh, interview very interesting people. We are a group of secular humanists. Today we're going to interview our dear friend Fred Arcaleo. Fred, welcome to When Humanists Attack. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you. Great to have you. Fred, I've, I've been very interested in interviewing you for our show for a while now. And I'm just going to dig right in because I do want to hear some of your performances. So this is how it's going to roll out. I'm going to ask you a few interview questions and then you'll perform for us. All right? Beautiful. Sounds good. First question. Tell us, tell the public, our, our, our humanist family, tell us how activism has informed your work. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's um, it definitely is like the center of my being. A really good friend of mine who's a fellow teacher told me I was hanging out with her a couple days ago and she said, you are so clear about what your mission in life is. And it was kind of cool to hear that. Um, but I do I felt it right away as soon as she said that. And I guess it, it's a little weird because I, you know, I grew up as a kind of a class clown a uh, very happy-go-lucky, easy-going kid that I didn't have any political consciousness or understanding of the world. I was really very naive and innocent, which, you know, all kids are. But I think particularly I grew up in the suburbs in Connecticut. I didn't really know uh, about the world. And I had this kind of period where I, I, it dawned on me, you know, they have the word woke. But I, no, but I'd say over a few years when I was in college, I started to look beyond my immediate surroundings. And uh, once I kind of kind of clicked in that this is a, a, a world, this is a planet, and people around this world are suffering in all different places, in different countries, and we're in it together. And if we unite together, it's our only chance to actually change these conditions because the conditions are consistent around the world. So I kind of had this epiphany over a period of time and it just, um, I kind of locked in to a kind of commitment that really gave my life purpose and also kind of um, informed how I, how I act, you know, how I go about gathering information, who I talk to, what I do with people the kinds of ways that I spend my time, even with leisure time, like I was mentioning, I was just coming back from a trip. So everything in my life, I try to connect in this kind of synergistic way to this kind of commitment to a, a different world, I guess you could say, a, a different system than the kind of world we live in today. Awesome. Awesome. Fred, you use the word, you use the word that's very, what can I say? Um, you used the word just recently in your introduction uh, that's very kind of, it's kind of political now and it's, it, it's very incited. I, I, I guess I can use the word incited. And that word is woke. I was reading Morgan Parker yeah. yesterday yeah. overstating woke. Could you go, uh, could you delve a little bit into that term woke? What does that mean? Yeah, it's. Yeah, I love, I'm so glad you asked it because, you know, I don't use that word. I just happen to put it out there right now because I was reading, I've been reading too about, you know, it's like post-woke era and all this stuff. And it's, it's how I came upon it was a student called me woke. <laughs> it was pretty funny. A former student came back to visit me and he told me, uh, Mr. Arcaleo, you know, you always were telling us about these things in the world, you know, and, and we know, this is what he said, of course, we never listened to you, you know, we kind of were, we were in our own world. And then I went to college and I realized Mr. Archileo, he was really whoa. This was several years ago now, but it, that was when I first kind of was faced with that term. And, and you know, I'm not a fan of these kind of, um, uh, you know, what's in fashion type slogans, but I do believe that originally when that started to become popular in the common in the mainstream over the last several years, 
it was referring to a development where there was a sense of consciousness, social consciousness that was becoming a little more apparent than it had been, I think, on a, in a larger percentage of the population than uh, it had been. So I think, I, you know, I, probably, I tend to agree. It's a kind of a post-woke era, you could say. But then again, I was never in the woke era. You know, I've been doing this kind of stuff since the mid 80s. So I think it's, um, I, I guess I think there's lots of different terms and you know, people come upon it like this former student, he came upon this term and it was helpful to him to realize that this was an advance for him and his development. And he shared it with me as a way of thanking me. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that, I mean, people in, who are in power, who control the use of words, who run media t uh, companies and, and platforms, they are, you know, we can certainly criticize them, but the terms right. that woke came from the working class didn't come from the rulers. The rulers co-opted it and are using it. But I think, you know, we have lots of terms. And that's, I was mentioning to Chris earlier about the term uh, activist. I feel similarly like, you know, if people say you're an activist, I don't, I'm not going to get mad, but I like to think of myself as someone who's in the world and I'm trying to get other people to be engaged and to work and become activists or become woke if they want to use those words. But basically, get involved to um, commit yourself to changing this world exactly. because it's a matter I, of survival. I, I totally agree with you, Fred. And I do think that you have a, a, a deep, a compassion for activism. I've done work with you in New York. I mean, like that, that, that project that we did with the People's Cafe, you know, for us not to have a chance to interview, I mean, to really have chance to rehearsal and to come out with the kind of magic that we came out with in that, that, yeah. that show, it was amazing. And I appreciate your friendship, your determination, your activism and your teaching. I'm going to just move right along. You know, sure. I have not really uh, talked to you in the, few, in the past about your background, but we had a conversation yeah. once about your mixed race heritage. And so I want you to talk a little bit yeah. about your mixed race heritage. Where are you from? And yeah. how, how has that influenced right. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm so glad, you know, Robert, I, I'm so appreciative of your friendship. And this piece that you're bringing to me is a real... A, a huge part now of my where I'm going in my life is a kind of acknowledgement of where I come from, which I kind of didn't, I was unaware of. I mentioned you know, I grew up in the suburbs, but interestingly, my parents didn't grow up in the suburbs. My parents grew up in the cities. My father grew up in the Bronx. My mother grew up in Lima in Peru, and they had a tremendous knowledge of the world that, you know, you move to the suburbs. This is part of U.S. culture and around the world, this kind of suburban mainstream culture in many countries now, where it's kind of like, hear no evil, see no evil. We want to go somewhere where we can hide out and hope everything's okay. So um, I, I just returned from this trip to Italy, um, which was precipitated by going to a wedding. But I ended up convincing my wife, it wasn't hard, to go to the place where my parents lived before I was born, which was Naples. They lived there for a year, and I didn't know this growing up. I kind of come upon this over the years, realizing that my parents uh, grew up, uh, they were living in Naples a year before I was born. I was conceived in this place. My father was in the Navy, and he was stationed there, and my mother went to, uh, to be with him. They had just gotten married, and it's, it, my parents had this kind of, uh, international romance, this love story, where they met at a port of call when my dad was in the Navy in Lima and was only there for like three days. And they met at this military dance that my mother's friend dragged her to, she says. And um, they, so they kind of had this connection. And then he left, you know, he went back on his ship. He was in an aircraft carrier. And um, he was then stationed, I think, in Germany or something. So they had this little interaction at this dance. And somehow through a relative of my mother, she got in contact with my dad in Germany. This is how, you know, life can be. And they started this long distance letter writing. 
and my mom is wow. Peruvian, so she knew English. That she she did study English when she was growing up, but it's her second right. language, and it was very broken at the time. And they have right. this this whole box of letters that they exchange wow. back and forth on that old airmail paper that um, is very light and papery and very delicate. And um, so all of that is unknown to me for most of my, you know, I, I grew up, I went to Peru several times when I was a kid. So it's not like I didn't know my mom was Peruvian, but my dad didn't speak uh, Peruvian, or my bad dad didn't speak Spanish, so my mom didn't speak it in the house. And it was only when I went to visit her family, either her sister or, or one of her sisters, or when we went to Peru, that I had engaged in this language, like a completely different universe. Yeah, when I went there, I felt like it was like a Midsummer Night's Dream. It was, it was so incredible and awe-inspiring. I would stay there for several months, and then I would come back. But the funny thing about it was I would come back, and I would just like, for a while, I, this is my funny story, I forgot English. One time I went down there, I came back, I was uh, five years old, and I couldn't remember English for like a, a several hours, basically. I don't know how long, but I have a very vivid memory of that. But once that where it wore off, I was back in suburbia where my mom spoke English and my dad worked, you know, and my grandmother and on my father's side was Sicilian and they were very ethnic with their own heritage. So I kind of, that was more of what I was aware of growing up. But even then, I'm in the suburbs and everyone was quote unquote American. My grandmother, even when she was younger, used to change her name to Arcolio, which is a kind of Americanizing of Arcoleo, which is a Sicilian Italian name. Yeah. So like I had this ignorance of my history. So kind of follow, getting to the heart of your question now is like, this longer, this discovery as an adult, when I finally went back to Peru on my own and became, I had spoken Spanish as a kid, but not well. So I became, I started working among Puerto Ricans first in Connecticut and then in New York among Dominicans for the last 25 years. And so now I feel like I'm completely immersed in not just my, when I say my culture, I mean the culture of the internet. National workers, you know, like I'm in France at this wedding, I'm learning French. I'm in Italy, in these different places in Italy, which each have their own culture. And I'm learning about those particular ways of life that people have. And it's a very similar. We have so much in common around the world. But that, I, I think we miss that in the United States, by and large. Many, this kind of quote unquote American culture and people, what's the American food? McDonald's, you know, there's very, there's real, uh, entrenched ignorance and no one it's not the people's fault it's the way we're all trained we don't really know so one of my projects with my students as a teacher and in my art and my music and poetry is to try to unearth this as I do it myself because I'm I'm really very much a student I'm learning Italian now like I, I'm very much um, a student of this discovery of my background and then encouraging others to bring their stories into into play so that we all kind of learn how tremendously varied we are but how tremendously similar we all are all around the world in terms of what our core needs are thank you that so i hope did, that answers absolutely. your question and that that's a great segue into our last question for you before we hear some of your wonderful music I know that you've been a, a public school teacher for 30 plus years and I, I admire you, you know, I come, I, I'm, I'm a product of two teachers, 30 plus years as well. So I know the uh, endurance it takes. So I want, to, I want you to tell me a little bit about that journey, um, being a public school teacher in New York, which is, which is distinct. And what do you envision for yeah. you? In the future. Yeah, well, that, I love that tag at the end about the future because, you know, my life is a little bit in transition now because I am coming to the end of my time um, in terms of my, my teaching career. I, I'm going to be 30. It's my 35th year this year wow. of teaching, and I'm eligible to retire at the end of the year. And, you know, I've had some health problems over the years, and it kind of comes down to my commitments and I, I've had this commitment that we've been talking about and I've taken it, it's really been the, the fiber of who I am. And in my teaching 
where I've taught and what I've done while I taught is informed by that. So I'm, for example, I, in Connecticut, I was teaching in areas, uh, deliberately chose areas that were more integrated um, in Will I, I taught in Willimantic, Connecticut. I taught in Hartford, Connecticut. I taught in Meriden, Connecticut. And then I did do a little sojourn in the suburbs in Berlin, Connecticut, which was a pretty amazing experience for its contrast to where I had taught before. But in each of those places, I was, had this idea of trying to gather information about who I was working with and help them to resolve the particular issues in where they live. And so then I moved to New York in the 90s. So my, and even then, I chose the neighborhood where I lived. I wanted to live and work in the same neighborhood. I wanted to be in an integrated neighborhood, which that's a loaded term because it's not quite integrated, but there are people from different backgrounds who are segregated. But in the school, I was able to interact with people from a lot of different backgrounds. And, um, and so I, my teaching has been my, my heart for many years. And so as much as I... I realize now that I've been an artist all this time. My artist is about so big and my teaching is like the heart of me. So as my, I bring in my music into the class, I've taught creative writing. I've constantly, I teach literature, so I'm constantly bringing in the, the literature that really moves me and sparks me and inspires me. Yeah. And, and then I, and that I feel very deeply about. But at the same time, I'm coming home at like eight or nine at night or even later um, and for over many years and it has kind of beaten me up I'll be honest with you I, I I've had a stroke when I was 38 I have a chronic neck condition that is I've had pain in my left side from the stroke and then from this chronic neck condition for over 20 years and I got I woke up with a headache in 2014 that has not gone away April 4th, 2014. And it's just, you know, I've been riding myself as much as I believe we all need to engage. I have often gone out on my own to do what I think is needed. And it has been at the, at the risk of my own health, which I'm trying to learn how not to do that as much. So I consider it all a gift because, you know, even with these health ailments, uh, I, they've really brought a lot of wisdom in how we can, how do we operate? We need to take leadership, which is why I'm not so keen on activism, because I think everyone, that term, I think everyone needs to take leadership. Uh, on the other hand, we all, we need to work collectively because when we're out on our own, we can, we can beat ourselves up and we, we're vulnerable to attack by the powers that be who really don't like a lot of the stuff I sing about and teach about. So I, I used to teach this workshop called Teaching is a Dangerous Profession. And I, I loved that concept when I came up with it because it's dangerous on many levels, but it was really designed to help teachers to feel a sense of responsibility to every day's work, apart from their families and the fact that it's just a job, which it is a job. Um, I want them to realize how important that job is, but also it, it's dangerous in the sense that you, when you're teaching certain things, and this is in the news now too, you can be attacked for it. And so, and I'm talking about the good things, like things like anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-imperialism, and kind of what I would call pro-working class values. That's unfortunately not accepted, even when they say it is. Um, and so that's been a, I've been involved in many, many struggles over many years, and I'm very proud and grateful and humble about it. And it's, again, it's informed my music because be, I write songs that are based on all this experience. So even when my songs are not saying this is what happened at school today, that's really where the, it comes from, my students and my colleagues and my neighbors. Fred, you've been, you've been amazing. And to our humanist family out there, we will... Um, put links to Fred's work in his bio, and w we will encourage our public to listen to your work. Fred, so we're going to give you an opportunity to play some music for us, you know, because that's where I know you in the arena of music and poetry and art. I think that's, that's where you really shine in my world. You know, I have performed with you in the People's Cafe and other places in the underground in New York, and I appreciate our yeah. connection, collaboration. But won't you 
give us the honor of playing a few tunes for us today. Um, so I am honored, Robert, and I'm really grateful. Thank you for having me here. It's, it's very funny. It's like you say, I mean, this was me. I met you when in one of those times where I was trying to eke out some time at night or on a Saturday to go and express myself outside of this job that, you know, I walk to school every day. It's 15 minute walk back and forth. And that's basically my world, you know, in my neighborhood. And uh, I love it. But it I also have other needs in terms of expressing myself to a wider audience. And I would go to these events. And like you said, the, the poetry and music underground of New York City, which there's not really an overground. <laughs> there's only an underground for the most part. Yeah. And right. that's how you and I met. And it was me trying to right. eke out some of that yeah. time to release all these things that I was learning during the day. Exactly. Um, so uh, uh, I will say, I would like to say, let me see if I can get a little different shot here. Chris, I hope this doesn't mess you up. I, see, I don't, it would be nice if people could see this guitar also. But um, that, so um, I am, I'm working on a new CD right now, a new album of songs that are all inspired by the pandemic. One was written right before the pandemic and one was started before the pandemic. And as soon as the pandemic hit, I told myself, you got to finish that song right now. <laughs> so, um, so it's a collection of six songs right now, which I think is probably going to stay like that. And it's a way for me to um, just express myself uh, and try to connect what I've been learning. I've had some really traumatic experiences over the last two years. And so these songs are um, my latest foray into what I call rally folk music. And I'll just say one thing about this. Um, if you visit some of my pages, you'll see this reference to rally folk music. It's, when I first put out my first CD, which is, took me like 20 years to put out basically, um, I was asking my friends, I don't know what to call this music. It's like folk, acoustic, blues. I didn't really know what to call it. And I put it out to my Facebook friends as people do this is like 2010 and they all chimed in with different things one of my friends says well you are uh, don mclean uh, meets phil oaks and you know don mclean is like a popular music writer in the 70s and phil oaks was this very political active singer did all political songs and another friend of mine said you write rally folk revolutionary serenades so when i heard those two little phrases out of all the different things people said i was like oh Oh, that's good. Thank you so much. So I got this term rally folk music. And I guess to me, it's kind of means like I want to write songs, whatever the genre that will try to inspire people to, like I said, in my daily life to get engaged. And I found that. Yeah, well, I've, I tell you, Robert, I've found that with poetry and you, I know you know this, too, with poetry and music, it's a kind of it's a different channel. And many times yeah. I'll be talking to people about what's going on in Afghanistan or Syria or Yemen or even in New York City with the police killing people. And people are like, oh, that's Fred. You know, he's always talking about racism. You know, they'll say different things, not to not to put them up. But, you know, I get a lot of that. But I'll sing a song with the exact same message and people go, Fred, I love your song. I love this line. So, you know, it's funny how music has a way to kind of enter into people in, into people's woke consciousness or something or their unconscious maybe so i i tell you i started this song I, maybe i'll play this one first i started this song as a letter to some co-workers of mine to my co-workers who have been going through a really hard time and uh you know it's during covid and even before covid i've been going through a real major campaign in my job and in my life my school has been kind of having a rough time so <laughs> I wrote this as like a love letter to my colleagues to inspire them. And in the middle of writing it, um, these workers in the Bronx at, um, in Hunts Point, I don't know if you're familiar and if maybe some people listening know okay. that uh, there was a strike last year. It only lasted about a week, but it was a profound strike in the middle of the pandemic of uh workers from 22 different companies in these warehouses in Hunts Point. And here's one of those things like, who knew 
that 50% of the fruits and vegetables of New York City come from these little, or they're not little, but they come from this one warehouse complex, right? But it's 22 different companies and they're all, it's very complex how they all interact and of course how they all conspire legally to screw the workers that work there. And these workers took a, a, a very courageous stand during the pandemic because they were getting screwed. They're cutting their health care in the middle of the pandemic. So it just really struck me that this was going on. And I go, I got to visit these picketers. So I took the song I started and I, I finished it with these workers in mind at Hunts Point. And it's, it's kind of ironic. I, I missed the strike because I was supposed to go with a group of friends to the picket line on Sunday and they revolved the strike on a Saturday. Uh, but I've played it at several other demonstrations since then with that in mind, because I think it's, kind of, it's a message to all workers, to my coworkers who I love dearly, who are teachers, as well as every worker. Um, and it's called The Mighty. And I hope you can, can you hear this okay? Yeah. Uh, does that guitar sound all right? Beautiful, all right. So I'm gonna try to do this justice here in my sweltering little room. It's called The Mighty. So let me see, oh, sorry, I got play it up here, let's see. All right, all right. Do you remember all our adventures over the years, over the centuries? And I mention it because now, in terms of survival, we need to rise from the dead again. We need a revival. We are the first and we are the last. We are the mighty working class. When you feel the most like hiding, we should take a look inside yourself and see. You have a history. We have our ancestors and made sacrifices on altars of misery So we can stand here today and feel this song Sweet to this beat, our music so sweet Sing along We are the first and we are the last We are the mighty working class When you feel the most like hiding we should know how good it feels to be fighting for what workers need. We should have no illusions that the people in power will accept revolution. But that is what we need. And the world's on our shoulders. And in turn we are learning from the giants that came before us. And we are the last We are the mighty working class When you feel the most like hiding I wish you'd know how much is riding On what we all do What each of us do We are mighty And we are fighting We are the workers we stand and united, no more hiding. We're singing black, brown, and tan. Women, trans, and men, young and old. Everyone who can. We're singing black, brown, and tan. Women, trans, and men, young and old. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Sorry. I, I couldn't hear my guitar in these earbuds, All so right, I had to man. like shake First, them up. The, the energy flow. The energy flow. <laughs> oh, I'm man. so glad. Thank you very much. Man will join us for our first salon on September 3rd, along with our other friends. And so I just encourage all of our uh, humanist uh, family out there that are listening to Fred, there will be links in his bio, but do uh, come back and visit us on September 3rd, and he'll be a part of our cadre of friends that we're gonna invite on September. 
3rd at 8 p.m. I'm Robert Gibbons. Thank you so much, Fred Archuleo. Thank you to the people, the production staff behind this. When Humanists Attack Chris West, Vincent Downing, um, Roger Kimmel Smith, all of all of the people that put this together, I thank you so much. Thank you, Fred, for being with us. Thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone at the Secular Humanist Group. Fight, fight back. Women, trans, <laughs>